Hi everyone, I'm Rob Sumsky, a product manager for OpenShift, and today I want to take you through a deep dive of OpenShift 4.0. OpenShift 4.0 um, is a re-architecture of OpenShift to support um, ongoing management of the cluster, um, so better day two operations. Um, and this comes from a lot of the CoreOS technology, um, all about having a better installation, uh, reconfiguration, and upgrade experience. Um, ultimately, it's going to bring over-the-air upgrades to OpenShift. A lot of this is powered by a new set of immutable infrastructure um, and a new operating system from Red Hat called Red Hat CoreOS. Um, this is going to bring an infrastructure as code focus throughout the entire platform. Another big theme that we're not going to touch on much today is the operator framework, all about building smarter software on top of OpenShift. Um, but today I want to focus on the first two boxes. Um, so some of the work streams uh, that enable this uh, idea are a redesigned um, installer. Uh, so for OpenShift 4.0, uh, the first platform we're going to uh, support is Amazon. Uh, so this has a new bootstrapping workflow um, that provisions a lot of the infrastructure for you. Uh, so you get things like auto-scaling out of the box, um, doing different node pools, uh, for example, having CPU and GPU workloads sitting next to each other. Um, and all that under the hood is powered by that new operating system, Red Hat Core OS. Um, which is all about immutability. So we're discouraging you know, SSHing to specific nodes in the cluster, um, doing manual configuration um, or debugging of those at a node level. Um, there are cluster facilities for doing that. Um, so we want to kind of move the, le the level of thinking all the way up into the cluster. Um, also powering that immutability is a technology called Ignition for doing machine configuration. And we're going to dig into what that means. Um, it's useful to go back and compare this to OpenShift 3 before we talk about OpenShift 4. So OpenShift 3 really um, separated the operating system from the platform itself, and I represented that with two boxes here. Um, so what you would do as an admin is you would manually provision RHEL, however you do that. On Amazon, that might be using an AMI. Um, on uh, VMware, that would be importing um, the operating system image. Um, on bare metal, you might be network booting it. Um, however you would bring up a node, you can bring up RHEL. And then um, the admin would be uh, relied on to correctly configure that operating system uh, and all the configuration drift that might happen over time. Um, the folks that set up the initial set of machines might not be the ones that are scaling it out a year later. Um, and so drift happens there, and just humans are going to be humans. Um, and then uh, when you want to upgrade the platform, uh, OpenShift Ansible um, has facilities for doing that in an automated fashion. Um, and that's going to touch limited parts of the node, you know, maybe um, change the kubelet configuration and some of the other RPMs on disk. Uh, but for the most part, the operating system is kind of an exercise left up to the um, admin to manage over time. And that also leads to drift between these two boxes. So with OpenShift 4, we've just recognized that um, these two boxes are inherently linked. And so we're bringing the operating system under control of the cluster. Um, and so uh, the, the cluster can manage um, pools of Red Hat uh, CoreOS machines and their configuration and their life cycle, um, just recognizing that these two uh, are just inherently linked and really important for the stability of the cluster. Um, so for day two management, um, the, the thing is that the cluster needs full control over the nodes to do that. Um, and let's talk about why. Um, so immutability uh, brings that repeatability. Next time I add a node onto this cluster, uh, I want it to function the exact same. Auditability as well. Um, there haven't been one-off changes that were made to just one or two of these nodes out of my 500 that are in the cluster. Um, but what that doesn't mean is that you're losing um, the ability to change your configuration. This cluster doesn't have to be static. It can be auto-scaled. Um, um, you can change the configuration. You can uh, change up the way you're doing things. Um, but you want to do it in a very controlled fashion such that the cluster is aware of it. Um, and so that means that the two themes that we're going to talk about for the rest of the session today are uh, inextricably linked, uh, the immutable infrastructure and the day two operations. Um, I want to introduce two new terms for you. Um, so uh, that's user provisioned infrastructure and installer provisioned infrastructure. In OpenShift 3, um, the default and the only way that you brought infrastructure was if you provisioned it as we just walked through. For OpenShift 4, we're going to introduce a new installer provisioned infrastructure. This is uh, the fact that the Amazon installer, for example, is going to uh, configure your EC2 nodes, uh, all the security groups, hook up the load balancers, um, do everything you need to have a functional cluster. Um, and then optionally, you will be able to provide um, that user provisioned infrastructure in the same manner as before. Uh, this is very useful for um, bare metal environments where you, know, you don't have these rich APIs. You might need to be racking these machines manually and powering them on. Um, so you'll have a way to get those into a cluster as well. 
Um, so at the core of the immutability is machine configuration. Uh, and I want to talk about how Red Hat Core OS is uh, configured and it uses a technology I mentioned earlier called Ignition. Um, what Ignition is, is a declarative set of uh, things that you want to do to mutate um, this machine. Um, and uh, what's unique about Ignition is it only uh, runs once on boot. Uh, so once you apply a config, you know, this machine is not going to get touched again. Um, and it runs before system D starts. And what that means is you can configure all kinds of low-level stuff, even about the init system itself, um, how uh, networking is provisioned, um, what happens when you want to, um, you know, how do you want to treat your root volume, doing RAID, all that type of stuff. Um, and this is all because it runs in the init RD before uh, kind of PID1 starts, which is really cool. Um, and so what it looks like is, you know, at first boot, you marry this configuration with the operating system image, um, and then that is the node um, that should never be mutated again um, and uh, we'll talk about if you want to mutate those, how to do it. Um, so what we've done is introduce a set of cluster API objects. Um, and these are objects that are in a working group of uh, the Kubernetes community um, for declaratively managing the cluster, just like you do your applications. So if you're familiar with a um, deployment and a replica set um, and then a pod, these are the same concepts for machines, a machine deployment, a machine set, and then a machine itself. Uh, if you look on the right, this is exactly what that looks like. So I've got a machine deployment for all of my worker um, nodes. And then um, this makes a machine set for each availability zone on my um, cluster, for example, on Amazon, uh, US East 1A and 1B. Um, and then ultimately under that, uh, they're going to have replica accounts, and you would spin up the appropriate number of Red Hat Core OS machines. Um, this is what that looks like in practice. Um, I can show you some screenshots, but let's just click around in a live cluster really quick. Um, so this is my uh, live OpenShift 4 cluster. You can see uh, I've got um, all everything good. I've got some alerts firing. Uh, just need to tune those a little bit. Um, and let's go dig into uh, what we have here. So here is um, a set of machines. So I've got um, some different uh, machines. You can see that they look like the availability zones that I have in US East 2. Um, and if you dig into that, um, you can see that there is some configuration about them. Um, so I've got three nodes, one in each of these availability zones. If I wanted to change that, I could scale them up. Um, and you know, this is tracking how healthy they are, um, what's going on, and then uh, the actual machines themselves. Uh, so if we want to go look at all of our machines. Uh, we actually have our workers and our masters here. Um, and if you're wondering uh, why there um, is only uh, worker machine sets, but we have our three masters here, um, that is because the masters are special. They're running etcd on them, and so you don't want to be um, killing them in a highly dynamic way. It doesn't mean you can't recover them, um, but you don't want to auto-scale them like um, the, the rest of your nodes. Um, and so that's the reason that they are just uh, manually created machines instead of uh, machine sets. I'm going to look at one of these workers. Um, you can see that it's got um, some really interesting stuff going on, everything that you would expect. Um, so if you're familiar, um, with how Ignition works um, on uh, Amazon and other cloud platforms, that uh, profile is passed in via user data. Um, so we've got a secret here that is a reference to what that user data is. Um, what this means is you can have different user data per um, availability zone if you wanted, um, per region, um, per type of uh, worker, per type of other machine that you want. Um, you can see that we're kind of hinting where we want this to be placed. Um, we've got the instance size that uh, it should be using. Um, some of the things about uh, security groups um, added to this load balancer. In this case, we don't want our workers added to a load balancer. Um, so all the things that kind of uh, describe what you would do to bring up a VM on EC2 or Azure, um, or then a machine on VMware or a bare metal machine would show up here. Um, let's take a look at a possible cluster architecture and see how all of this comes together. Um, and so this is a fairly typical uh, kind of production-ready OpenShift. Um, this is, I've transformed it into OpenShift 4, but these architectures exist for OpenShift 3. Um, what we've got is a control plane in the upper left. These are running our master workloads as well as our etcd machines and their uh, M3 extra lodges. Um, and you know they've got a unique um, security group um, and all the ingress and egress uh, controls for that. Um, we've got our big set of workers at the bottom. These are all M5 lodges. Um, and you know we can scale those out accordingly. Um, we've also segmented off a few special workloads from kind of those two base uh, profiles. We've got a logging and monitoring machines, um, and these are some high memory machines to keep our Prometheus and our Elasticsearch databases um, in memory and really performant. 
Um, so we've got some facilities for steering the workloads to those only. Um, and then we've also got some special routing uh, workloads. Um, these are where we've got a hole punch in our um, security perimeter so that um, we can get internet traffic into um, the cluster. And then that's going to point specifically to all the worker nodes and all the applications that are running on top. Now, the interesting part about this is um, not necessarily this configuration, but it's what it looks like um, for the machine deployments that we just talked about earlier. Um, and so, once again, you've got your specialized control nodes on the top, um, and then you've got just a set of deployments for our workers, our logging and monitoring machines, and our routers. Um, and this is the, the config that you would pass in to the OpenShift installer to set up that entire infrastructure. Uh, what this means is you can scale all of these independently. If you wanted to um, you know, change the number of workers, that's very easy to do. Um, and all this desired state is managed by the cluster. So a machine deployment is a real Kubernetes object. Um, and so you can go say OC edit, um, you know, worker machine deployment and scale it up, scale it down. Um, and then you can also do rolling machine updates, uh, config updates. So what this means uh, for, you want to change the size of your uh, logging and monitoring machines, for example. Um, you can change that and do a smooth rollout of those. Uh, same for your workers or your routers. Um, and ultimately, anytime you have a special something, um, you can actually carve off machines and have it dedicated to that workload. Uh, so you have a, a GPU instance type, and so you want just a certain number of workloads to use that GPU. Um, set a machine deployment, add either some taints and tolerations or labels, um, and then steer your workloads accordingly. If you have a workload that needs special security for whatever reason, um, you can lock it down uh, further or keep all those workloads running together. Um, and then really a special anything, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, you can have a machine deployment that's going to steer those workloads um, and keep them isolated or not um, according to what you need. Um, so we kind of talked about the low level stuff. I'll call those machine operators, if you will. Um, so that's our first box, but there's another uh, set of these loops running um, for doing day two operations, and that is ongoing um, cluster operators, the things that are gonna run uh, the platform itself, the API server, our scheduler, some of the security stack, um, all that good stuff. And then um, what actually powers the over the air upgrades is the update operators. Um, so once again, I've got some screenshots, but so let's go take a look at a live cluster here. Um, so let's jump over to the cluster settings page. Um, and here you'll see that we've got this new global configuration area. Um, and you'll see that you know all the main parts of the stack have this configuration, authentication, DNS, image management, uh, some of the infrastructure itself, um, how we're handling ingress, and then OAuth. Um, so let's say, for example, that I want to change some of our OAuth settings. Uh, my users are complaining that they're getting logged out too frequently and say, okay, we can, we can bump up some of those settings. Um, go over here and you can see that this is the canonical source for what that um, uh, token max age should be, for example. Um, here I've already raised it, um, so you could you know, set this really low, uh, set it really high, let's you know, do a million seconds or something like that. And under the hood what's happening is if I save this file, there is an operator that's looking for this, it sees the desired state has changed from what it uh, currently was, and will go reconfigure every part of the stack that needs to do that. So if we've got to um, restart two pods, maybe we need to restart one of them before the other one, whatever, all that logic is in the operator. Um, so that's all you need to do is change this, uh, this value here and everything will just work correctly um, and come up. Uh, now you can do this for every type of configuration. Um, so if you want to change uh, the way some of the infrastructure works, some of the ingress works, um, all that is done by operator. Um, and by doing this in the cluster, now that desired state is stored there um, such that it always knows what's going on. Of course, making that happen under the hood, as I mentioned, are all these cluster operators. Um, so here you can see them reporting some of their status. Um, so we've got a bunch of them that, are, you know, I mentioned our machine operators that are doing things, something that's running, some of the Kubernetes control plane, uh, some of the image registry that's inside of OpenShift itself, um, DNS, ingress, etc. cetera. Um, you can here uh, see that we've got some messages for everything's all up to date, uh, for example. Um, and also there's this version column. Um, and so you can see some of this uh, hasn't been filled in yet. This is what we're going to be polishing up over the, the process of this beta. And the version is really important because, once again, uh, over-the-air upgrades are all about versions. Um, and so an over-the-air upgrade of OpenShift is really just a new set of versions of all of these operators. Um, and so they'll know how to go from one version to another. And so we do a rolling deployment of the operators themselves, and they will do everything that needs to happen to the cluster to make it um, you know, go from OpenShift uh, 
4.0.0 to 4.0.1, for example. Um, and we'll be shipping some over-the-air upgrades for OpenShift 4 later in our beta cycle. Uh, so I hope that gave you a good insight into exactly how the machine is brought up, some of the immutability um, that is new to the platform and why some of that exists, uh, and how that ultimately is going to empower your business, um, have you uh, be able to be successful with new architectures um, and new types of workloads running OpenShift. Thank you for joining.